Welcome to Lecture 5 of Biology 116 entitled Unicont Diversity 2. In the previous lecture, we looked at the first form of unicont diversity, and that was focusing on fungi. We're going to now continue our stepwise progression on the complexity of life, as I like to call it, all the way from when we started from non-living viruses to now, which will introduce the animal world. We're going to begin discussing animals in Unicont Diversity 2, and we'll also discuss animals even further in Unicont Diversity 3. As far as the first couple of uh, videos on this lecture are concerned, we're going to be focusing on the following. We'll entitle the first flowchart, Animal Characteristics 1. The key idea we want to establish right now is what makes an animal an animal. We hear the term all the time something is an animal, right? But we never really delve deeper into the idea of what makes animals unique, what makes animals more successful than lower order organisms, what differentiates a higher order animal from a lower order animal, etc. So how can we figure out what an animal really consists of? What really classifies as an animal underneath the premise of a unicon, this idea of unicon diversity, of course. And so we're going to begin by focusing on the idea that all animals are heterotrophic. This is a key idea to remember. All animals need to obtain organic material from their environment. They cannot make it themselves. In essence, this heterotrophy that we, as all animals, possess is based off of the fact that we, you and I, both ingest and also digest our food. But the thing is, this heterotrophy is specific to animals the ingestion and digestion because we do this within our body. So we'll say ingest plus digest food in body. This is different than somebody that's relatively closely related to animals and those are fungi. Fungi, they do heterotrophy of course, but their heterotrophy is not within their body if we remember. They secrete those hydrolases, those hydrolytic enzymes that are going to break down those molecules and then they'll absorb it. That's all external to the body. We have made a big difference right now in our heterotrophy versus fungi heterotrophy in this first and foremost fact that we do our ingestion, aka when we eat the food, when we swallow food, when we uh, put food within the mouth, and then we also do our digestion, our breakdown of the food within our body. So that's a big point to remember about animals that differentiates us from many other organisms. It also specifically differentiates us from a fellow unicon, the fungi. Okay, so now we have our heterotrophic capabilities out of the way. In addition, animals also have a unique cell structure. Now, we've heard of this before many times. We all know that animals are eukaryotes, so thus they have a eukaryotic cell structure. Most of the time, animals are also multicellular. Almost 99% of the time, we're, we are multicellular organisms. So why is that? Why are animals the ones that get this multicellularity? Well, multicellularity is a key fact that makes animals unique. Thus, it's also going to be something that makes animals more complex than lesser animals, let's say. We've studied single cellular animals, uh, and we've studied single cellular organisms, I should rather say, in the idea of a prokaryote, in the idea of a protus, sometimes even in the idea of a fungi. But what we're focusing now is multicellularity. Complexity is increasing, if you haven't noticed in the past couple of lectures. This is a big point that I'm going to elaborate on in just a second. Just to, was just worth mentioning for right now. In addition to our cell structure, there's something we lack that uh, fungi do have, but we don't. Uh, we have no cell walls, and we've noticed cell walls as being a highly conserved structure in many different organisms. We have uh, no cell walls, and we'll understand why um, as we move forward through the lecture series. And finally, last thing, uh, something that makes us very unique is the fact that we have, and when I say we, I always am referring to us as animals, everybody in the animal world and animal kingdom. We have external proteins that are actually outside the plasma membrane. They are outside the PM, the plasma membrane. What does this mean? These are proteins that are literally transcribed and translated in order to connect cells. They are not within cells. They're actually on the outsides of cells. And they, with this connection comes structural support. When you connect cells, you create a structure. And if you have a strong connection, you have a strong structure. We have this exactly like this. 
we don't fall apart uh, we, you know when wind blows by us we stay strong our structure is strong we're not limited in terms of our connections between cells and thus we have this multicellularity to fall back on and because we're multicellular we need to connect our multi cells we need to make sure they're supported well we use these external proteins like collagen example would be collagen collagen is a specifically animal like protein only seen in us as in as animals as far as my knowledge is concerned collagen is a defining animal protein because it's an external protein that helps connect our many cells and gives us a nice structural support so that's our basic cell structure to work off of in terms of our animal characteristics. Another key idea, another huge reason animals are unique, another huge reason animals are successful, another huge reason animals are complex is the organization of all of these cells that we have. It's not a haphazard organization. We don't have a random dispersion of cells. What we have is a very highly organized collection of cells that are going to form into tissues, which we'll get into, and then those tissues will form into organs and you know the rest. That's our organization. And our organization is premised on the fact that we as animals, all of us, all of us have this. All are with differentiated. This is a key term you need to know. Differentiated. Nice term to know. Which simply means, I'll put this in parentheses here, which simply means the idea of specialized cells. Okay, we all have specialized. All with differentiated, otherwise known as specialized cells with very specific functions, with very nice evolutionary, successful evolutionary adaptive functions that are uh, of great use to the animals using, utilizing them. Why do they have specific functions? Well, that's because they have specific cells. Why do they have specific cells? Because these cells are differentiated. That's a term we're going to be using over and over and over again. Now, we can step. Uh, we can go a step further with this idea of cells being differentiated, having a heart cell, let's say, or having a lung cell. We can take that further and look at the first part of what I just said, a heart cell or a lung cell. In most animals, we're going to write this down over here, in most animals, when, I, when we say most animals in this situation, we basically mean higher order animals. In most animals, we are, uh, ha they have differentiated tissue. So we take it a step further. We not only have specialized cells, but we have differentiated, specialized tissue, specialized heart tissue, let's say, specialized tissue that is good for a cardiac system that we have, which I'll get to in just a second, the system idea. So most animals with differentiated tissue, because we have differentiated tissue, this is otherwise saying the following. We have tissue which would just be defined as a group of cells, so that's what tissue is, you know, many cells collected together, with a common structure. A common structure would be nicely promoted with these external proteins we, we mentioned before. This common structure that we have between these group of cells would be nicely promoted because of these proteins. This structure and, and connection would be really good in providing this commonality. It's a group of cells with common structure um, and also function as a unit. It's a plus sign. Plus function as a unit, a cohesive unit. This is an incredibly complex process to take many cells, multicellular organism, differentiate them, specialize them, and have them all work together as one large unit. That large unit is something that we would call, and I'll do this over here, if we take this tissue concept and build upon it even further, this differentiated tissue, we end up with higher animals Higher animals like you and I, like a cat or a dog, these are higher animals, typical animals you would see in a zoo, let's say. Higher animals with differentiated, there's that term one more time, specialized, differentiated, and what are we going to say this time? Not tissue, not cells, we're going to build differentiated organs. Differentiated organs are going to be the result of cells being differentiated. Those cells being differentiated collecting together to form differentiated tissues. And those tissues combining together to form, of course, differentiated organs. The basic cell theory of life that we know about. Again, with this idea of organs, organs are very good at what they do because they are adapted. They are strongly and positively adapted to perform the specific functions that we take for granted every single day. Every single heartbeat that we do, every single uh, step that we take are done by a variety of complex organs adapted to perform those specific functions. So that's 
a very powerful thing that we have not seen in any way, shape, or form in anything before the animal world that we've covered in biology thus far, in Biology 116. So we're getting very complex very, very quickly. Last point about organization, definitely remember this. The defining organizational characteristic of animals is the fact that all animals have highly specialized muscle and nerve tissue. Muscle and nerve tissue play big role in all animals and thus you would consider this a unique defining characteristic of all animals. Unique defining characteristic, C-H-A-R for characteristic. Big idea here. All animals have, you can very easily spot an animal if you look at its muscle cells or nerve cells, aka its brain, its ability to look at higher cognitive functions, um, all those ideas associated with the nervous system and the musculatory system. And that will definitely show you a defining criteria that creates a highly organized, highly differentiated, highly specialized, highly complex system that constitutes the entire animal as a whole. Okay, So that's our basic organization of an animal, very complex, and because of it's so complex, it's very well differentiated. Last thing about animal characteristics in this video is the idea of reproduction. So what we've covered so far is structure, the idea that animals have a very complex structure, cell-wise and even above the cell, um, macro level, and we also covered the idea that cell animals survive through heterotrophy. They ingest and digest food in their body. Now how do they reproduce? Because life is all about survival and reproduction. Reproduction in animals is usually sexual. Now, this does not mean that animals are the only ones capable of sexual reproduction. There are fungi capable of sexual reproduction. There are plants capable of se sexual reproduction. But we, as animals, usually are the most, most predominantly sexual reproduction. And for that reason, predominantly in our lives, we will have a diploid state of cells. Diploid, if you remember, means two, two N, meaning that you have information from your mom and information from your dad. Mother and father both give you information to give you the organization of DNA that you have known as diploid state. Um, the diploid stage, we will say, is dominant in animal reproductive life cycles. Now, where is it not dominant, though? Where is diploidy not seen in animals? That is within the gametes, right? And the gametes are a result of meiosis. So through meiosis, a sexual uh, cell cycle process, we get gametes. And gametes, if we remember, are, of course, haploid. They are N. They're half. Meiosis means to make smaller. They are half the genetic information that all the somatic body cells are. Most of our body consists of somatic diploid cells. But the specific gametes, sperm and egg, are going to be a result of meiosis that only have half as much DNA. Why do they have half as much DNA? Because we need to undergo sexual reproduction. If we need to undergo sexual reproduction, the eventual result, the eventual completion of sexual reproduction is successful fertilization. Should not be news to anybody. This happens to every single animal. Fertilization is the idea that we have a small flagellated sperm cell so flagellated, it has that flagella structure. It's small. Um, it's a very. Uh, it's basically just DNA uh, encapsulated and also a bit of mitochondria on that sperm cell. We'll get into that when we talk about reproduction later on in the semester. That's of course haploid. So I'm going to put an N on the side here. A small flagellated sperm fertilizes, and we should know the end of this story. A large, and we call not flat non-flagellated. We actually say non-modal. This non-modal egg from the mother, this is actually not able to move. It's a large, un, uh, usually doesn't able to, isn't able to move egg that gets fertilized. We have this N plus N scenario here. Um, there are no ifs, ands, or buts about this. This is not like fungi sexual reproduction. In this N plus N situation, we don't have any, any uh, um, divergence of the idea of N plus N leading to 2N. We don't have, what I mean is we don't have a heterocaryon. We don't have a dikaryotic state. None of that. We immediately have karyogamy, which results in the combination of the karyo, the nucleus of both egg and sperm, which leads to a 2N zygote. The 2N zygote will be of great importance to us as we move forward because this is what's going to restore diploidy. When you have a 2N zygote, you restore the diploidy of the organism, and from this point forward, the zygote stage, we will develop eventually into a complex, highly organized, highly structured, highly heterotrophic, sexually reproducing animal, which will actually go through the actual steps of that complex development 
uh, throughout this lecture a little bit later. And that covers animal characteristics one.